Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSPS Ukraine War Update Extra video, giving you the extra tidbits and nuggets to get your teeth into to give you a greater understanding of the war in Ukraine. Where should we go to first? Well, another good old thread from Mick Ryan, the retired Australian general, who is uh, prolific in his output, both in writing, but also in interviews and also on Twitter, well worth following. Over the past two months, so he's going to talk about uh, the counter-offensives, uh, the counter-offensive uh, that the Ukrainians or, or offensives that the Ukrainians are planning in the coming months. So over the last two months, Russia has undertaken a series of thrusts in eastern Ukraine to capture territory and weaken Ukraine's armed forces. Soon it will be the turn of the Ukrainians to resume their offensive operations. It is important uh, to explore the purpose of these offences because those planning them will have to balance multiple political, strategic and military imperatives for the coming attacks against the Russian forces. Purpose in these circumstances is vital. It provides a starting point for strategy and operational planning, but it also ensures that those who will participate in these offensives understand why they do so. That's a really important point that ha that was that's been missing from the U from the Russians' uh, activities in Ukraine. Igor Gherkin talked about this when he, as the former um, commander of the Little Green Men, the Russian forces in the Donbass region in 2014, and indeed the DNR and the LNR, the Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic forces. He, he was in charge of that, and then he's gone back to being gone to being a military sort of blogger and vlogger. Uh, he then volunteered, went to the front lines, and then so he came back from there and then talked about it. And he, one of the big observations he made was that no one knows what they're fighting for on the front line. I mean, this is a Russian, a uh, hyper-nationalist Russian military blogger who has experience of fighting and was indeed in charge of, of troops in 2014, saying the troops in 2022-23 don't know what they're fighting for. The Russians are there. They're there because they've been mobilised, called, called like, they'll, yeah, there'll be a few volunteers who are well up for this and have their idea of what this is all about. But ostensibly, most of the Russians don't understand a purpose and how you can then get them to commit to the the, the efforts you know, coherently, but also to, to have a sense of, you know, high morale um, and... A sense of purpose. They can't have a sense of purpose because they have. They don't understand the purpose, and therefore it's more difficult to get the most out of these troops. Uh, so soldiers will always follow orders, but it is purpose that inspires them. So morale is such an important component of warfare. Provides the foundation for extra exertion, exertions, and often is the reason why so many offer their last full measure of devotion on the battlefield. We have seen countless vi videos of Russian uh, soldiers n not exhibiting that, not being crazily devoted, giving up. So we've seen videos of them committing suicide. And these are people with a lack of, of purposes, with an existential despair. What are they fighting for? Because Ukrainians are fighting for their families, their, their friends, their homeland, their culture. The Russians are mobilized, many of them forced in, or conscripts just doing this so they can get out of a jail sentence. Um, not many of them are there out of nationalist fervor. I mean, they might have nationalist fervor, but it's not the reason why they're there. Um, so he continues, what are the elements of purpose in Ukraine's force, forthcoming offensives? First, Ukraine wants to resize the initiative in this war, reseize the initiative in this war. Their Kharkiv and Kherson offensives grasped the initiative from the Russians and forced them onto the defensive over winter. However, for a variety of reasons, including slow arrival of Western support and the injection of Russian mobilized troops, Ukrainian momentum seeped away over the Christmas to New Year period. Now, with the Russians generating some momentum with their Easter attacks, the Ukrainians will be keen to reverse this momentum and regain their battlefield advantage. It's well worth noting that I think, was it in February, the Russians, or maybe even January and February, the Russians took 0.04% land back, or something like that. There's just a very small amount of land. When you, when you compare, say, the ISW or deep state maps from you know, the end of December, to 
the present day and just flip between the two, you'll see really only marginal gains for the Russians. And that's essentially around Bakhmut, really. Very minimal. And that's that's the the result of their entire counteroffensive. Just oh sorry, their offen- their entire offensive. Um it's, it's incredible. Uh now uh, so he goes on, in doing so, it demonstrates to Russians that nothing they do can destroy Ukrainian resolve. In this battle of wills, destroying Russian morale will be an important objective of the Ukrainian offensives. Ukraine will want to spread the word to the entire Russian invasion and occupation force that their days in Ukraine are numbered. This psychological aspect of offensive operations is very important. The Ukrainians also want to take back their territory. This is an obvious and important goal and one constantly referred to by President Zelensky in his speeches. Large parts of Eastern and southern Ukraine remain under Russian occupation. For those in our areas occupied by Russia, the Ukrainian offensives will provide a ray of hope that their turn for liberation will come soon. Another obvious purpose of the offensives is to continue degrading the Russian army. The Ukrainians will want to destroy as much of the Russian army as possible, but this is subordinate to recapturing territory. I suppose these two are hugely connected because you are going to be more likely to recapture territory if you degrade the Russian forces, uh, especially past the tipping point. So uh, what they're doing around Bakhmut, it appears that the intention is to degrade the Russian forces so fundamentally there that actually the place is now ripe for a counter-attack or a counter-offensive, a larger counter-offensive, if if the Ukrainians deem it sensible to do that. Uh, it, the area there will not be mined uh, as uh, as largely it has been in other parts. There won't be defensive trench networks built there substantially as they have been elsewhere because that's been the scene of Russian attack. Now, if they if the Ukrainians flipped it now and then attacked back there, then it, that might be a sensible place to do so. But the idea is that attriting the forces allows them a greater chance of gaining territory. So, yes, their primary objective is territory, but the treating forces allows them to get that territory. Uh, so anyway, um, the Ukrainian offensives will also be a vital message to the West that the Ukrainian armed forces are able employers of the military assistance provided over the last few months. So it's really important that they do get success uh, because this is more likely to get them more uh, equipment, I guess. There are two ways of looking at this. You could say, oh, the West might get desperate if they see Ukraine getting hammered and, and throw them more equipment really quickly because they're scared of it going wrong. But the, at the same time, that might be a reason they might just give up and say, oh, look at the equipment. It hasn't amounted to anything. We're not going to bother giving them anymore. Whereas if the Ukrainians get success, th- there are two ways of looking at it. They could say, well, they've, they've got success. We don't need to give them any more. They're succeeding. Or it, it says to us, okay, great, so you've done well with what we've given you. We need to give you more so you, we get this thing over and done with. So there are arguments either way, but one would assume that success will breed gr- greater generosity, I think. Um, finally, the offensive matter greatly to the Ukrainian people at home and those who remain refugees abroad. Since 2014, Russia has occupied its territory and conducted a sustained information campaign against the notion of Ukrainian sovereignty. Since February 2022, the people... Uh, of Ukraine have endured rape, murder, destruction of their cities and system- systemic attempts by Russia to eradicate Ukrainian culture, symbols and nationhood. Uh, the offensives launched in the next few months will be, sorry, uh, oh no that goes to an article, I do apologise. The offensives in the next few months will be heartbreakingly bloody and may not be the final blow that destroys the Russian army in Ukraine. Now it's about managing expectations and that that's managing expectations of the Ukrainians of the diplomats of the foreign nations particularly allies obviously uh, the public of foreign nations who support the lawmakers making those decisions so our expectations need to be managed here so the counter offense it's very easy to get swept away with positivity and, and optimism go these counter offenses are going to be amazing they're going to absolutely slam into the russians they're going to be left in pieces it's going to be a collapse but the reality is that the the russians have have done some pretty substantial digging in over large parts of uh of the occupied territories in fact brady afric on uh 
Twitter and amongst other places, has got maps. Indeed, he's he's updated his maps uh, and been talking about it in the last couple of days, uh, showing exactly where the Russians have dug in. And there have been some serious fortifications being built in this southern area in Crimea, but pretty much everywhere. So the counteroffensives, you, you may laugh at those defensive entrenchments and, and fortifications, but you know, you put them together with minefields, they will slow down any offensive. If, if we won't see the lightning quick offensive because you're having to do huge amounts of mine clearance, so on and so forth, you are going to see slow and methodical offenses, probably maybe punctuated with quick moves here and there, but then having to fill in behind and do all the slow work of liberating these areas, putting in administrations, making sure it's safe, etc. etc. It, 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 or, and it might just not be that successful. They, the Russians might defend particularly well in certain areas and the Ukrainians might really struggle to, to make the kind of gains that people are expecting optimistically. So it's about managing our expectations um, and, of course, the Ukrainians managing their own. Uh, but if the West holds its nerves its nerve, and the Ukrainians steadfastly apply their fighting power against the Russians while taking back large swathes of their land, the offences may be the beginning of the end of this war. And that's exactly what we hope. We, we assume they've been doing a lot of background work, not just the training in Poland and Germany and the UK and elsewhere, but tactically, strategically, operationally, all those kind of all, all that thinking needs to be done by those great military minds using uh, NATO support as well in there to to make sure that they've they've got the best planned counteroffensives that they possibly can have um, in order to do that. Right, Trentalenko has a uh, has a thread here. He usually deals with logistics and whatnot. This is a Russian casualty, Russian culmination thread based on this latest Ukrainian general staff report. So this is from yesterday. Yesterday's report, twenty sixth. Two days ago, the Russians are at 170,550 dead right now. What does this mean? Now, he's obviously assuming the uh, accuracy of those and talk about that in a, a little bit in a second. I've gone deeply into the subject of battle casualties, non-battle casualties and KIA to WIA casualty ratios in previous threads like this. And he, he uh, refers back to a previous one. So I'm going to do cliff notes to cut to the strategic point. So killed in action against wounded in action, there's varying ratios given. I mean, usually you hear something like one to three or one to four. So if you have 100,000 casualties, it might be that 25,000 of those are dead and 75,000 of those are wounded and taken out of action, meaning 100,000 in total. That's a one to three, which is a one in four. It's the difference between ratio and proportion. I could teach you that. I have literally taught this before. Um so yeah, that's that's a that's a one two three or a one in four, uh, but some say one two three or one two four, which would be a one in five. Um, anyway, uh, at a two dead to three wounded casualty ratio, Russia has suffered two hundred fifty five thousand eight hundred twenty five wounded in action to, on top of the hundred seventy thousand five hundred fifty dead. That is a total KI plus WIA. A total of 426,375 Russian battle casualties. This doesn't include non-battle casualties for which, for which see the link below. And he's talked about that previously, going back to look at the Second World War, looking at particularly winter time, so on and so forth. Using the US Army, uh, this is Korean War actually, a non-battle casualty ratio for the Russians in Ukraine adds a further 30% to both KIA and WIA numbers. That is another 127,913 Russian soldiers. The total combined, the combined total of battle and non-battle casualties is 544,288 Russian soldiers to date. Um, which is a pretty big number. Uh, Russian Russia invaded Ukraine with around 120,000 and increased it to 190,000 by the end of March 2022. In May to June 2022, the next Russian conscript class came in with 120,000 and Putin annexed Donbass, Kherson and Zaporizhia to Russia so he could use conscripts in Ukraine. Then he did a stop loss on existing 
conscripts and contract troops indefinitely. In September 2022, Russia started a mobilization of 300,000 Mobics. 190,000 plus 120,000 plus 300,000 is 610,000. 610,000 less 544,288 is 65,712. Now, I hear all the usual suspects saying Ukrainian numbers must be BS. The uh, enumerates are like that. Uh, the Russian army has never e has never either Wagner PMC nor the DNR LPR colonial militia as Russian army. So, sorry, he, what he means to say is they've never counted those uh, as Russian army. Ukraine does. There are, there are arguments as to how all the figures are kind of calculated. There were 24,000 LNR DPR militia at the start of the war, and Wagner PMC burned through 30,000 casualties by February 2023. And he is, he's linking to some of these claims. Adding back the 54,000 Wagner and colonial militia forces as bullet catchers for the Russian army gives a strength level in order of 119,712. The Russian co colonists also did their own mobilization, which took U every Ukrainian male in occupied territories between the age of 18 and 55. The floor of, for that LNR DPR mobilization is 15,000, and it was likely double that. Call it 22,500 as the most likely case. Additionally, there are still many thousands of Wagner PMC for the purpose of this analysis. Let's call it 10,000. Adding 32,500 to 119,712 is 152,212. It's been five months since the 300,000 Mobics of the first um, mobilization started arriving in October 2000, uh, 2022. The average of uh, 824 KIA a day started in February 2023, and it's 26 of March 2023 now. Given November, December 2022 were over 500 killed in action a day, the 300,000 Russian Mobics brought in since September 2022 are all casualties by no later than the end of this month, assuming it hasn't happened already given the September to October 2022 casualties. And he refers back to the these are these are compiled um using the general staff stats though and again this is all relying on accuracy of the ukrainian stats here but he's saying he his case is that they are accurate this is likely more than 152,212 russian in ukraine right now simply from standing forces stripped from standing russian military units but nothing over 50,000 uh, but nothing over another 50,000 in so many words russia has only has more meat in the pipeline without any operational reserves to speak of inside of Ukraine. We are seeing a lot of signs of this with the way the Russians are treating their wounded. Uh, and Chris O has a thread on this uh, talking about uh, um, Vukladar. And in fact, that, that might be a, a, a thread I could look at next. Uh, the use of Stalin era blocking units is another. And again, I've talked about that, how, how the Russians are now claiming that this is definitely a thing where if they retreat, they get shot by blocking units behind them. So if we have all of this going on, why aren't Western intelligence agencies going to town screaming this from the rooftop? Short form, it isn't in their interest to talk about battle casualties, casualty ratios, non-battle casualties and the implications of same. A lot of the US political left, media and academics point to defence contractors as a real parasite sites in the national security state. They are not. Defence contractors want a military build-up to face China because of cost plus contract profit margins. Buying missile and artillery ammo for Ukraine or refurbishing Cold War surplus equipment is low margin, firm, fixed price all the way. Uh, the real parasites here are the Western national security bureaucracies whose Budgets are based on a strong Russian threat. Russia losing to Ukraine and getting kicked out of Ukraine's 1991 borders make a whole lot of Western permanent national security states surplus to need. Learn Mandarin would become the learn to code. Uh, that the tech classes have hit the working class with. The failure of Western Russian analysts to mention the decades documented concept of non-battle casualties in a, a single time in the entire Russia, Russo-Ukrainian war is the poker tell in that regard. The thing is, not talking about it doesn't mean it isn't, hasn't been happening. The failure of Bakhmut to fall to Russia is just one of the many events related to the systematic undercount of Russian casualties to date. We will see more when the Ukraine Ukrainian counteroffensive arrive, perhaps enough to require some deserving people to learn Mandarin. Okay, goodness me, right. So Trentilenko has uh, an axe to grind here. Uh, 
But what he's basically saying is that there are a lot of deaths, a lot of battle deaths and non-battle deaths. And he has done previous threads on why he thinks that that's pretty accurate. The, the question is, you know, do we believe his account? Are the Ukrainian figures accurate? Uh, and indeed, that's what Perun has, has done a big old video on just in the last couple of days that is absolutely worth looking at. In the first half of the video, he looked in exactly at that, which are the, the number of personnel losses. And basically, they're going to be inflated on both sides. But you, you, you look at the range from the very bare minimum to, to the kind of way out maximum uh, or, or the very bare minimum conservative estimate to you know, pretty acceptable upper range. And you're going to be somewhere safely in there. Uh, both sides are going to be somewhat inaccurate, but he then looks at the Russians and says, well, they, they really are very inaccurate, what they're claiming, particularly what they're claiming the, the, you, that the Ukrainians have lost. And he goes on, the second half is to talk about equipment losses, and there are connections between personnel loss and equipment loss. If there are personnel on board equipment, you're going to lose a lot of equipment, you're going to lose a lot of people, and so on and so forth. So there, there is a kind of connection, but it's, it's possibly easier to kind of verify equipment losses because you get uh, photographic evidence and visual evidence of the losses for, with people like Oryx that give you a very good conservative minimum. Yes, there might be a couple of double counts, but, but there's also going to be a lot you haven't counted. So you can say safely say that what Oryx say and that has had been lost on both sides is definitely what has, what has at least been lost. It's a, it's a very conservative minimum of what has been lost. And then you can look at people like BBC uh, Russia and Media's, no, Medusa, who have, who've compiled the same for human losses and said, right, you've got a bare minimum. These, these are uh, Russian obituaries and funerals that have been announced that have been not just people in the army that have been you know, having their funerals announced, but that have that have been specifically claimed to have died in Russia. So they're very tight on on exactly what the criteria are for, for counting these people. And, and so they do have a, a minimum number of Russian losses. And you look at Oryx, you've got a minimum number of equipment r Russian losses. And it gives you a sense of where the baseline minimum is. But then he goes on in the second half in talking about the equipment losses to show how the Russian figures compared to the Ukrainian figures, are way out, right? So when I get Russian voices in my thread saying, oh, why are you using the Ukrainian figures? Why don't you use Russian figures? You get some people saying, that literally, that the Russian figures are really accurate, like the Russian MD figures are accurate. It's like, they are not. And the reason I don't use those figures is because they are so inaccurate. And the general staff figures may be inflated somewhat, but they give me an indication of the trends. But also, I think they are at least somewhat accurate, compared to the Russian uh, figures. Well, let's look at, let's dip into a, a couple of things that Perun says, but go and watch our whole video. It is magnificent. To say that equipment loss figures in Ukraine are highly contested would be a dramatic understatement. Both Russia and Ukraine's ministries of defense put out their own estimate for enemy equipment destruction. Both are pretty opaque about how they calculate their particular estimates. Asking around, for example, many told me they thought that Ukraine's estimates were simply a result of all of the reports from various units engaged in frontline contact, reporting their estimates up the chain and those being aggregated. But that belief certainly doesn't create certainty. And the Russian estimates often look like they were pulled directly from some parallel pocket dimension, in which Russia was fighting a successful conventional war against NATO and were halfway towards Berlin. And while these statistics seem to describe completely different wars, I think it's likely they both have one thing in common. If historical standards are anything to go by, they're probably both too high. And absolutely. So, you know, I, I understand the Ukrainian figures are too high, but for me, are they more accurate than the Russian figures? Well, he goes on to give a good indication that, yes, they are. But if you take those natural pressures towards overclaiming and you apply, for example, a culture of systemic lying in order to make oneself look better, a phenomenon that I've talked about in the context of the Russian army before, and you can see theoretically how overclaiming might become a serious issue. And to illustrate this for a moment, let's have a look at the official Russian MOD estimates of destroyed Ukrainian equipment. I don't want to spend too long on them because they're kind of a soft target, but at the same time, they're very frequently used. The Russian official estimates of destroyed Ukrainian materiel are fanciful. 
At 404 Ukrainian aircraft destroyed, the Russians have destroyed the entire pre-war Ukrainian air force more than once, and then they've overachieved by also shooting down all of the aircraft pledged to Ukraine but which haven't yet arrived again more than once. All of Ukraine's MLRS systems, including those that have been resupplied by the West, have been destroyed more than once. All of Ukraine's HIMARS systems supplied to it by the United States have been destroyed, some of them more than once. And those HIMARS systems are being kept company in the equipment afterlife by all of the M777 artillery pieces that the Allies have supplied. Now these claims put out by General Konoshenkov and the Russian Ministry of Defense have on occasion been openly mocked by channels linked to, for example, the Wagner Group. I've used this message as an example before, but it is hilarious and the sarcasm is real. In short, the numbers are not just likely highly inflated, they're literally impossible. Which is a win for the historical pattern of militaries overclaiming, but not particularly helpful if we're interested in a realistic estimate. A much more conservative source of estimates, for example, might be a visually confirmed loss database, with Oryx being perhaps the most famous. And he goes on to detail how Oryx do their counting, but we'll join him a little bit later. So here he talks about using the Oryx data as a, as a, as a floor, your absolute conservative minimum, and then taking it from there. And so I generally look at something like the Oryx database as a soft floor on the total amount of losses we can have some degree of confidence that at least that number of vehicles have been destroyed, captured, or damaged. So what does that data show us? Firstly, it provides a sort of flaw to likely equipment losses for both Russia and Ukraine. As at time of recording, that's 9,798 pieces of equipment for Russia versus 3,131 for Ukraine. It also allows us to check the official claims being made by both sides against what we can visually verify. In some categories, the differences are quite wide, particularly in aircraft, but in others, the official figures get a little closer. For example, for every 2.7 MLRS systems that Ukraine claims to have destroyed, we have visual evidence for one of them. If you're interested, the equivalent figure for Russian MOD claims is 27 to 1. This is super, super important, right? So if you're talking about the accuracy of the Ukrainian claims, the general staff com claims, compared to the accuracy of the MOD claims, we have visual confirmation of one MLRS. So for the Ukrainians, let's start with them. For every one visually confirmed, the Ukrainians are claiming 2.7 have been uh, destroyed. Right, so their their claims are 2.7 higher than what we've got visually confirmed. Now, visually confirmed are going to be uh, your Bare, your bare bones minimum. So you can imagine the real gap between, let, let's just, I don't know, let's say it's going to be 1.5 to 2.7. So that there might be that kind of gap in, in the ratios there between the reality and the claim of the Ukrainians. But it's pretty close. The Russians, for every one that we've got visual confirmation of that the Ukrainians have lost, the Russians are claiming 27 have been destroyed. So even if you're thinking, okay, let's close that gap a little bit by doubling the visual confirmation, so the visual confirmations are undercounting by, you know, 100%. So it would be 2 to 27 or 1 to 13 and a half. The, the difference between these figures, I know this is just MLRS, but the difference between the Ukrainian and the Russian figures in terms of accuracy is like orders of magnitude here. It's just... That is why I am happy to talk about the Ukrainian losses and uh, claims losses of the Russians and throw in a couple of caveats and say, I think they're somewhat accurate, but I'm not quoting the Russian stats because I just think they're way out and there is evidence, there is good rationale behind why those figures are way out. For every system Russia claims to have destroyed, we have evidence of one. For tank destructions, the Ukrainian figure is a little bit under two times the visually confirmed figure. And as you'd expect, in every case, the visually confirmed figure is less than the equivalent MOD figure. So 1.9 is, so when you look at the tank losses that Ukraine claims, actually, for every uh, 1.9 that they have claimed, there is definitely one that we've got visual evidence of. So it's less than double. If we look at the tanks here, 3,595, we've actually got, is it, it's about 1,900 now, is it? Uh, tanks that have visually been confirmed to be lost. So 
if that's a conservative estimate, you could probably guess. Mm, I don't. I'm pulling. I am pulling this figure out of my posterior. But say that you, you've got one thousand nine hundred visually confirmed. Let's say that you might have two thousand four hundred or something like that. Two thousand five. I don't know. Uh, then you've got a fairly accurate, considering there's going to be elements of propaganda, there's going to be elements of like genuine mistakes, which is like, we hit that tank, yeah, I'm going to not notch that one up, but actually that tank was able to drive on and it, it was all right. But So genuinely they thought they're taking it out, but it wasn't taking out, those kind of things. It, 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 you're, you're there or thereabouts, at least it's it's not completely ridiculous that when you get yet to, when you go to the russian claims it becomes completely ridiculous the graphs on the right also show the impact of the winter offensive you can see that the russian loss figures were basically flattening out towards january and then they started to increase significantly taking on a curve that was less aggressive than during for example Kharkiv and Kherson, but which was more rapid than during comparative lulls in the fighting or during previous periods where Russia has held the initiative, like the middle of last year. So looking at those figures would seem to suggest that Russia's rate of equipment loss roughly doubled once they commenced their winter offensive, and that the identified ratio between Ukrainian and Russian losses is very roughly 3 to 1. And that's where a lot of analysis will stop. Indeed, the next step is usually to take these losses, compare them to estimated new production, repairs, or foreign resupply, to determine whether either side is capable of making up the losses that they're suffering. But the and he then goes on to talk about people don't generally talk about depreciation and about how the more you use equipment, the more it breaks down. The Russians are using a load of equipment, as in look at their howitzers and how many shells they're firing every day. And they're happily claiming they're, sh they're using like five times as many shells as, as the Ukrainians. Yeah, but that means you're going to need to replace five times as many barrels. Do you have the ability to do that? How, what's your what your factory is looking like and he talks about the these factories being told to up their their production of new tanks up their uh, refurbishment of old tanks and the upscaling of old tanks and repair uh, broken down stuff and you're like we we're sanctioned we don't have the 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 parts we don't have the ability to do this i'm being asked to do more and more and more and straight away and it's just it's just going to be a, a job too far for, for for them to do that but yeah, go and check out Perrin's video. It is absolutely brilliant. Um, but And I will continue showing these figures on a daily basis, not because I think... I, I never concentrate on these figures here, like the totals, because I think they're, they're, they're just going to... They, they will be overcounted to a degree. But I think it's less of a degree... Than, than many think, particularly critics. So Russian and pro-Russian voices have come on and, and slagged these off. But dude, you know, those in glass houses shouldn't throw stones because your own figures are ridiculous. Like they are, as Perun says, they are actually impossible. It's not that your, your figures are overblown. You, you are stating things that are physically impossible. So of course they are wrong. So anyway, let's move on to uh, this video that's been doing the rounds. Here, Gonzalo Lira, who is uh, American-Spanish um, author. He has uh, rather like sort of Scott Ritter, given the pro-Russian narrative recently. Um, he, uh, yeah, a bit controversial. He says, hey, Americans, Germans, Poles, Brits, these are the ones you're supporting in the name of freedom and democracy. And he shares this video. So many people have shared this video. What is the video? I'm not going to show you because I want to move on. But basically, you have someone driving has a dash cam camera. So that's the first issue that we'll come to later. Uh, and then in a, in a lovely clean pickup, they uh, two Ukrainians with yellow uh, headbands get out the vehicle and then say you, you almost ran off off the road or something you show us your papers you need to speak ukrainian or something something like this uh, and calls her scum and then basically after sort of shouting at her this this happens <laughs> Пожалуйста. 
And that's the end of that video. And you could be excused for thinking, oh, that's absolutely terrible. You know, and this is this is how disinformation works. Uh, how do we know it's disinformation? How do we know this is made up? Uh, I mean, it, it's being spread so, so freely by these pro-Russian voices. Right. Tatarugami looks at this beautifully. Uh, so various Russian Telegram channels share a video that allegedly shows Ukrainians uh, stopping a car with a woman and a child. The child is not seen engaging in a verbal alteration and then shooting at the car. This looks like a stage video for the following reasons. The location where the video was filmed was reportedly has reportedly been identified by the Telegram channel, channel Moscow Calling as... Uh, this place so where is that place and and you can see all the, the bits of tree it has been located to oh that's interesting the identified location is situated deep within the occupied territory of Donetsk um uh, right okay by Makivka right okay so that's not in Ukrainian territory whatsoever okay so geolocation of the video is I mean that alone is right this is disinformation but we can go on uh, so let's go on uh, the soldiers in the video are wearing yellow armbands, which is an uncommon practice among Ukrainian soldiers who currently wear green armbands. So they changed to using green. Um, this raises suspicions about the authenticity of the soldiers depicted in the video. The fact that the woman uh, was driving with a dash cam is another cause for suspicion. It's illegal to film the movement of Ukrainian troops, and one would not be able to pass a checkpoint with a dash cam. Thus, the presence of a dash cam raises huge questions. Six, the car depicted in the video appears to be very clean, which is an unlikely condition for a vehicle traveling in a war zone. This gives the impression, impression that the car was recently washed for the purpose of filming the video. The soldiers in the video appear to assault the woman because she speaks Russian, which is a trope that is often utilized in propaganda. The portrayal of the soldiers as two masked Ukrainian nationalists stopping a car with a woman and a child and then abusing them because they only speak Russian appears to be a manufactured narrative from Russian propaganda propaganda playbook so i've spoken to tim white on the channel and he 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 speaks a little bit russian and he's been out there and he says so many people still speak russian is not a problem it's just it's not a thing but the russians are always claiming it's a thing so they say it's illegal to speak russian and that they've they've banned russian books and all this kind of nonsense um, additionally, the woman's name appears to have a Muslim origin, which aligns with recent fake propaganda videos circulated by Russians, uh, showing fake Ukrainian soldiers burning the Quran. It is worth noting that the location of the incident is deliberately obscure, making it difficult to determine where it took place. Additionally, all soldiers are conveniently wearing masks, obscuring their identity. Furthermore, there is additional evidence suggesting that the video is staged. However, I will withhold further analysis until it is completed. The video link can be access via that link and i've shown it to you a little bit additional as a user this user pointed out the cross on the back of the car is not a regular one which is used by ukrainian troops but stylized balkan kreutz uh, that resembled german troops during world war ii period another clear indication of a staged propaganda piece um and uh, further evidence is then provided of the exact location uh geolocated the story takes an unexpected turn and th this is this is quite incredible. Russian famous Telegram channel with over 300,000 subscribers has admitted that the video is fake. Quote, the video is fake, our crooked exercise. In conducting such information operations, there is still much for us to learn and improve upon. Which isn't to say it's wrong to give out fake videos, but he'd obviously got to a point, or the channel has got to a point where it's like, yeah, all the information is so clearly on the side of this being fake that we've got to admit it. We've got to do a better job next time. This is disinformation. So we see this video, it's disinformation. But I love open source intelligence when this happens. You know, when 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 it gets to such a point that people have to admit that the video is fake because the arguments are too strong to suggest otherwise. However, it will still be shared and it will still fall on uh, on fertile grounds where people can go, oh my goodness, look at what the Ukrainians are doing here. Uh, but of course, the Ukrainians aren't doing that. It's just an absolute staged piece of propaganda. Um, uh, talking about s staging nonsense, why you have to do this, I don't know. But anyway... Alhamdulillah. 
Ramzan Kadyrov. Look at him. Oh, he's such a warlord. Yeah, catch this on video, guys. Catch it on video. Have you got it? I'm in there. Have you got it? Yeah. Well done, guys. Thanks for thanks for making it out of uh, cardboard. But I've done I've done well to look like I've lifted heavyweights or whatever. Or I have lifted heavy heavyweights, and so what? Just oh, how old are you, mate? How old are you? Try and go. I'll tell you what would impress me: going and making decent moral decisions out there that involve people under your command, not running around shooting guns, making stupid propaganda videos that I showed previously, and I got a copyright infringement for. Uh, and then going to the park and lifting heavy weights because, yeah, great. Um, anyway, uh, uh, moving aside from toxic masculinity or whatever that is, uh, Ukrainian women. Now, I've been asked by several people, can you let us know or do a segment on what Ukrainian women are doing in the war effort and, uh, you know, in, in the army and so on and so forth? And I'd love to do that. I really would. I, I just need to find enough content to, to, to you know, do that. There is content out. I'm not saying there's not the content out there. I just, I need to go and look for it. I need to spend some time uh, looking into this. But Ukrainian women will never let us down says um ukrainian squad more than fifty thousand women are enlisted in the ukrainian army and they are still fighting for their freedom uh heroes says this one um uh, i'm sure uh, you know well yeah it's is yeah this is a, a modern war in in many ways in so many ways when you talk about you know the information war when you talk about technology but of course you're seeing um women on the front line you're seeing women volunteering uh in droves to to defend their country um in a in a way that you expect from ukrainians and obviously not from russians because like i talked about earlier they have no overriding sense of purpose for being there when you have that sense of purpose this is a reflection of 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 purpose uh, all the women on the front line but anyway um I would like to look in more detail at what they're doing. There are rather a lot of very well made up women on the front line here, which uh, does make me think, you know, there's there's going to be a, a little bit of propaganda going on in some of these clips, as you can see, you know, uh, rather than uh, the reality of fighting on the front line. But, you know, except that, that is, this is going to be a propaganda video. But I'm interested in, 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 in truly what, what the work of these uh, Ukrainian women on, on the front line and also behind the front line. I showed uh, videos previously of, of work a uh, school teacher was doing when she was working in the unit that uh, takes in all the information coming from people behind the front lines in Russian-occupied territories, spotting uh, targets for them and, and the work she was doing. Um, you know, changing. She said, "You know, I don't think I can go back to teaching now." Uh, she, that was pretty incredible. That's a really good BBC documentary. Um, anyway, last thing I want to talk about because uh, I've been banging on for way too long. Holy cow! Right, as you can see, I'm wearing a Gogol Bordello T-shirt. Who are they? What is that? Gogol Bordello uh, are a a Ukrainian plus band. Uh, the front man is Ukrainian. They've got people from all over the shop who are now based in uh, New York. They're kind of gypsy punk band. I definitely suggest you check them out. They may not be for everyone. Uh, one of their more melodic albums that would be more radio friendly for most of you, for some of you, Transcontinental Ho Hustle, which is just uh, is in one of my is in my top five albums of all time. I'm a very big music person. I was hugely into music uh, growing up. I've seen gazillions of bands live etc etc i saw gogol Bodello live a few years back with uh, lucky chops uh, who are a new york band um in brixton academy and gogol Bordello, both of them were stunning but gogol Bordello was just phenomenal uh to see live the energy brilliant anyway why am i saying this so he's ukrainian he came over um as a youngster to to america as a as a young man um and uh started up a band uh gogol bordello eventually and he has been in uh interview with jello biafra so jello biafra was formerly of the dead kennedys uh done a two-part interview with eugene hutz and it's actually interesting whether whether you're interested in in music or not there is quite a lot of music 
stuff in there that they talk about different bands and, and influences and whatnot. But also there's quite a bit of history and culture of growing up in Ukraine, of the influence uh, of, of Poland and Russia and the, these places, of, uh, and also of music, influence in music and, and culture in, in this way. And it also talks about language and history of Ukraine and then the present situation over the two parts of towards the end of the second one. There's a lot more to do with sort of Putin and the pre present military situation. It's a, it's a few weeks old now, probably a month old this, uh, but well worth checking out if, if you want just a totally different view of what's going on, but from someone who who is involved in by being uh, Ukrainian, but also having lots of contacts. And uh, in fact, I think that the most recent album, uh, Solidarity, is, you know, it's got a Ukrainian flag on the front and is very much in solidarity with uh, Ukraine. So anyway, Gogol Bordello. If you see me wearing a Gogol Bordello t-shirt, that's what it is. These guys, and they're not going to be for everyone, right? Uh, but uh, check them out, see if you like. I mean, how can you not like Wanderlust King and so many songs off the off the Transcontinental Hustle album? I'd I'd love to pump out. And lots of people know things like Start Wearing Purple. But anyway, check out the uh, the interview with Jello Barafra. Uh, really good stuff. Uh, thank you. Please like, subscribe, and share. Uh, thank you for your support for the channel. If you want to support the channel by buying some merchandise, you can pop on to uasupporter.com forward slash ATP. If you put the forward slash ATP, I get a little bit of commission, but I've got my own merch down there or, you know, whatever. Just watch videos and comment, yeah. whatever you want. You guys are awesome. Thank you.